Jones, the Crocker's Morton Marcy Friedman Director. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this special look at the exhibition, Legends from Los Angeles, Betty, Leslie, and Allison Saar from the Crocker's Collection. This exhibition features 23 works by internationally acclaimed artist Betty Saar and her two daughters and fellow artists, Leslie Saar and Allison Saar. The powerful exhibition touches on themes of race, grief, disaster, mythology, hope, and family, and it features works in each of the artist's distinct styles. All 23 works are drawn from the Crocker's permanent collection, and many are recent acquisitions. I'd like to extend my deepest appreciation to the following museum donors who generously helped make this collection and exhibition possible through their gifts of art and contributed funds. Especially like to thank Emily Leff and James Davis III, the late Lauren G. Lipson, Dr. Janet Molly Batana and Mark Manas, Shirley and Guy Moore, and the Sacramento chapter of Lynx. Purchases have been supported in part by the Marcy and Mort Friedman Acquisition Fund and the Forrest and Shirley Plant Fund. I want to thank you, too, our members, for your continued support of the Crocker Art Museum. Your annual membership makes it possible for the Crocker to provide access to the arts for everyone in our community, and it has enabled us to continue to provide art experiences, even in the pandemic, to teachers, students, families, and seniors. For that, I thank you. We have a wonderful program planned for you today featuring Crocker curator Jamie Yar and artist Leslie Saar in conversation. We'll also take a closer look at some of the works in this exceptional exhibition. I hope you have a wonderful uh, experience. Enjoy. Thank you, Lyle. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Amalia Griego, the Development Officer at the Crocker Art Museum, and I will be your MC today. I'm excited to have you join us as we take a closer look at the exhibition, Legends from Los Angeles, Betty, Leslie, and Allison Saar in the Crocker Collection with Associate Curator, Dr. Jamie Yar and artist, Leslie Saar. Before we begin, I would like to share our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the Crocker Art Museum is on the traditional land of the Nisenan people, and the current state of California is the homeland of many tribes. We are honored to be here today. As we begin today's program, I encourage you to use the chat feature to ask any questions. We will have a Q&A session with Dr. Yar and Leslie when the program is over. Now it is my honor to introduce Associate Curator, Dr. Jamie Yar. Dr. Yar specializes in American art with an emphasis on the late 19th and early 20th centuries. At the Crocker, her core areas of focus are American works on paper, photography, and Native American art. In addition to curating Legends from Los Angeles, she will serve as the in-house curator for the upcoming exhibitions, Louis Comfort Tiffany, Treasures from the Driehaus Collection, and For America, Paintings from the National Academy of Design. Dr. Yar holds an MA in Art History from the University of California, Davis, and a PhD in Art History from the University of Washington. Prior to joining the Crocker, she designed and directed university-level museum studies programs in New Hampshire and Minnesota as an assistant professor of art history and museum studies. Welcome, Dr. Jamie Yar. Thank you for the introduction, Amalia. I'm really excited to be here today and very much looking forward to sharing Legends from Los Angeles with Crocker members. I'd like to briefly give my thanks to those who have collaborated with us and worked tirelessly to make the exhibition possible. First, I would like to thank Betty Saar, Leslie Saar, and Allison Saar for creating visually inspiring artwork and for their support of the exhibition. To Walter Maciel Gallery, Catherine Clark Gallery, and Roberts Projects, a big thank you for your collaborative spirit, support, and flexibility with all things image related. I also want to echo Lyle's remarks related to our generous donors for their time, energy, and expertise. And to our docents and members, thank you for your continued dedication to the Crocker over the last perilous year. Last but not least, a note of thanks to all of the Crocker staff for their investment in this exhibition and the knowledge they bring to this event. With that, I'm now happy to say that we are going to turn to the core of our program today, a sneak peek of the physical exhibition. The video we are about to see is an inside look at the show and an opportunity to hear more about the key themes and to see the artworks up close and personal. So let's head over to the video now. 
Welcome to the Crocker Art Museum, Legends from Los Angeles, Betty, Leslie, and Allison Saar in the Crocker Collection. I'm Jamie Yar, Associate Curator here at the Crocker and Curator of this exhibit. We have 11 works by Betty Saar, 10 works by Allison Saar, and two works by Leslie Saar in this show. What's exciting about this exhibit is that it shows a diversity of materials, including everything from works on paper to works of assemblage and collage to installation pieces and incorporation of photography. We also have in this exhibit many key themes. For instance, race and racism, technology, memory, identity, and family. Just to tell you a little bit about this show, we have works by Betty Saar, who was born in 1926 in Los Angeles. She started her career in the 1950s as an interior designer. She married Richard Saar, who was a ceramicist and also a conservationist and preservationist, and together they have three daughters. Leslie, Allison, and Tracy Saar. Tracy is a writer, so not featured in this exhibit, but you're going to get to see works by the other artists in the show. Now, Betty Saar, after her work in interior design, was very much influenced by the Watts Towers in LA, the Watts Rebellion, often known as the Watts Riots, as well as the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in the 1960s and started to turn her attention to assemblage works, in which case she would collect artworks or objects from flea markets and swap meets or from her personal trove of objects and memories from her family. And she started to create assemblage works and she became very well known for these pieces. From there, her daughters, Allison and Leslie, went on to their own careers in art making, very much influenced by both of their parents. Allison went on to study art history and art, uh, particularly working with sculpture and installation pieces, and we'll also see some of her prints in the show today as well. And Allison and her sister often play off of ideas together, and they have definitely been influenced by Betty's work in assemblage. Leslie is well known as a painter and does quite a bit in terms of thinking of identity and also of thinking about the ways that materials can function well together. So I'm excited to be with you today. I look forward to talking about many of the works in the collection and really diving deep into key themes, issues of identity, and looking more at race and heritage in the show. Betty Saar's Remember Friendship is the earliest work in the exhibition and the earliest of the Saar's works in the Crocker collection. You have photographs of two women here with hats, high collars, brooches, very formal dress. And then in the center of the scene, you can see lace, you can see silk rosettes, um, you can see uh, various metal pieces, one with the letter R, one with the letter E. We have small uh, pins and jewelry. And in the center of the space, it does say, remember friendship. So it gives you a good sense of putting together bits and pieces of life that also, also reference personal memories for Betty Saar, but in many ways also reference her role as a wife, as a mother, as a friend. This was created the year after Betty Saar's great aunt, Hattie Parson Keyes, passed away. Parson Keyes was very influential in Betty Saar's life, both in terms of her upbringing and her artistic practice. So in many ways, this is also a reference to the memory and sort of the mourning, but also the good times with Hattie Parson Keyes. The series that you see behind me are eight lino cuts. This is called the copacetic portfolio or copacetic print series. Now, Allison is really well known for really meditating on a certain idea or a certain topic and doing a series of works. So what we see here is essentially a riff on a project that started in 1991 called Hear the Lone Whistle Moan. And this was a series of bronze relief sculptures for the Harlem 125th train station in New York. And this consisted of a number of figures, um, a train conductor, a woman, people moving in and out of the city. This was also a reference to the Underground Railroad. 
Fast forward to 2018, when the 150, 125th Street train station was undergoing a renovation, and Allison was asked to come back and do a new series of works for the shelters that are part of that train station. And she created various dancers and musicians and vibrant scenes about the Harlem Renaissance, and it's very colorful. And when the light shines through it, you get this sense of movement and this sense of kind of uh, vibrancy, so to speak. In 2019, Allison went on to make the copacetic portfolio that you're seeing behind me, which consists of individual linocut prints on handmade Japanese kozo paper. And what these consist of are specific scenes from the Harlem Renaissance. I want to focus on this work here, titled Hooch and Haint, which is part of the series. So hooch, as many of you might know, is bootleg liquor. So we see that in terms of the glass that the figure is holding here. And haint references an evil spirit or a ghostly-like figure. And you can see that the cigarette smoke is wafting behind the figure and creating this ghost-like form. Now there is a figure that we see here in blue and those sort of white ovals represent these empty or blank eyes in the background of the scene. That might seem a little bit strange at first, but it's actually a hallmark of Alison Sarr's style. You'll often see these blank or um, kind of vacant eyes in her figures. And we see it both in women and in men in terms of figural representation. Now the cigarette smoke that is wafting behind the figure there um, also references hair, which is another of Allison's key subject matters, in particular African-American hair and women's hair, a marker of racial identity. Continuing on with Allison Saar's copacetic portfolio, we're now looking at the work Torch Song. So you'll see a few of Allison's repeated uses of color, as well as some of those key stylistic elements. First off, you see that indigo blue in the background of the piece as well. Remember that indigo was a cash crop cultivated by enslaved African and African American people in the American South, and Allison uses that color to reclaim it for African American empowerment. We also see here a woman carrying almost like a big flame, or very much like a, a fire, almost like a fireball here. This is torch song. The woman has essentially this flame, almost like your flame has burned out. A torch song is a song for unrequited love, and torch singing was created by African American people in the American South after the Civil War. It follows the melodic structure of the blues. We're looking at Leslie Sars' I Turned My Back on the Ocean from 2019. Now in the Victorian period, hysteria or craziness was a malady that was disproportionately ascribed to women, and women were often affected by putting being put into mental institutions or being medicated in some form or at least having this label placed upon them. Now, when we talk about this idea of hysteria, it's really a reference to the title. I turned my back on the ocean. Now, thinking about this in terms of Leslie Sarr being a Californian and being specifically from Los Angeles, the ocean and the coast function greatly into California's existence and also an identity of being a Southern Californian. So what we have here is a reference to a woman who is clearly in mourning purposefully turning her back on the ocean. It's almost this sense of hysteria taking over or putting herself in harm's way or being so much involved in a sense of grief that she is hoping to be swept away by the ocean itself. Welcome back. I hope the video was an informative look at Legends from Los Angeles that helped to encourage creative and detailed thinking about the work of Betty, Leslie, and Allison Saar. It's now my pleasure to introduce artist Leslie Saar. Leslie Saar was born in Los Angeles, California to artist parents Richard and Betty Saar in 1953. 
While attending San Francisco State University, she worked at KPFA Radio in Berkeley as part of a Black collective, The Souls of Black Folk, and made illustrations for her writer friends. In the 1980s, she started making altered books. Her works now include paintings, drawings, book works, photography, banners, collages, dioramas, and installations. Sar's various artwork series include The Antheneum, Anomalies, Mulatto Nation, Tooth Hut, Autists Fables, Mad Woman in the Attic, Monad, Gender Renaissance, A Conjuring of Conjurers, and Black Garden, which deal with notions of identity, race, gender, beauty, normalcy, and sanity. She has exhibited nationally and internationally, and her work is in numerous museum collections, including the Kemper Museum, California African American Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Auckland Art Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, and the Crocker Art Museum. Leslie will be joining me for the remainder of today's event. At first, discuss her work and art making practice, and then to chat about key takeaways and to answer questions from members. Welcome, Leslie. Hi, hello. So glad to be here. And I'm really excited that the museum is going to be opening in a couple of weeks. And I'm very pleased to be able to present my, my slideshow. What I'm going to be covering are the last five shows that I've done throughout the, well, almost nine years, 10 years. And uh, starting with this first image, which is from my Mad Woman in the Attic series. And the idea here was that um, so many female heroines from 19th century novels were um, powerless or victimized. And so I wanted to do something focusing, um, sort of as was briefly mentioned before in the, that piece of I Turn My Back on the Ocean, the notion of insane female heroines and how in these novels, they actually gained agency by going insane and wrecking havoc. So I was addressing that uh, in my work. I did portraits of people like um, Bertha um, Rochester from Jane Eyre or uh, Therese Racan. Um, and then another aspect of it was specifically about the, um, the names that they gave for the mental illnesses that they ascribed to women. And so that's what this piece is here. It's called Religious Melancholy. And that was actually one of the very rather poetic names they gave to um, some of these um, maladies such as hysteria and also specific things like melancholia, virgins and widows or melancholia passing into mania. And um, so I, I did these portraits of women and then I also in, in, in incorporated photographs that I had taken. I set up these still lives and took pictures of those and that's what those circular images are sort of forming a, a shape around her. Next slide, please. The next series is called Monad. And uh, Monad is like a, um, it's an entity of a perfect functioning system from the universe and then replicated in its minutia. So this whole idea of as above, so below, this repetition of a paradigm. And um, this is from my interest in esoteria and studying uh, the occult and mysticism and that sort of thing. This painting here is called Celestial Bridge and it sort of represents the, um, the bridge between the East and the West and how it was mostly women in the 1800s who brought the esoteric teachings from the East to the West, such as Madame Blavatsky or Annie Besson or Alice Bailey. And the notion here is taking this as above, so below and kind of flipping it to where you have minuscule cells actually enlarged and the scale is flipped that they're the size of planets and um, the universe is sort of shrunk and it's just this sort of surrealistic notion I had of how to, uh, like I get these ideas and it's like, okay, how am I going to express it? So this is sort of my idea. In the next slide, you'll see another one from this series, which is called, not, uh, which is called Born, not Born Under a Rhyming Planet, I'm sorry. 
And um, here this couple is sort of floating along a gondola made of uh, skin cells, I believe that's what that is. And um, I wanted to have the colors very kind of bright and neon, which is a different color scheme than I'm used to. And juxtapose that with the people who are dressed in the 18th, 19th century outfits. And so the idea of futurism but incorporating the past, the whole thought behind the series was just how to turn everything upside down and combine things that are opposites, but sort of working together <clears throat> to kind of get the theme across. This one is um, cell realization. And again, the scale is flipped. The woman is standing on this you know, minuscule uh, or invisible uh, human cell. And um, I was just kind of trying to combine this feeling of these mm, women mostly hurtling through space, but yet having a stillness. So there's also that sort of tension and contradiction. And the little photographs in the background are eyes. And in the English language, I, E-Y-E -E and I, they're homonyms. So it's just sort of this idea of within this concept of esoterica, looking within and self-discovery, that that sort of um, pun or a homonym sort of fits within the theme of my Monad. In the next slide, we're getting to the series that I had, which was called Gender Renaissance. And this is a rather large banner, 85 inches high by 45 inches wide, where I have sewn, taken fabric and old bits of antique trims and uh, old applique or embroidery and sewn a banner and then painted on it. It's painted in acrylic. I work in acrylic. And this one is titled Miss Pearlie, the Transcontinental Mind Reader. Now the theme of gender renaissance is just questioning the notion of gender, the arbitrary notion of gender. And it is inspired by my trans son, a young trans son, Sir Jen, and just the experience of advocating for him and living through what this means to actually legally and in physical aspects change your gender. So once again, I have um, set the scene in the past, in the 1900s, in the Victorian era, which I just sort of love the whole melancholic, uh, you know, um, era of the 19th century. And that sort of is a way of me saying, okay, this is a contemporary issue, that of gender and trans and acceptance and the whole notion of um, what is gender and uh, arbitrary uh, way that gender is assigned, you know. Um, by setting it in the past, I'm kind of giving a distance or sort of drama to it, but also stating that this has been around for a long time. It's nothing new. The next slide is also from my series, Gender Renaissance, and it's called It's My Nature. And as one can tell by the title, it's like nature, what's natural. You are who you are, you know who you are. Um, in this series, I have like taken images from nature and biology and uh, various items that perhaps represent masculinity or femininity and sort of juxtapose them in the way that is surrealistic. And my style of using a surrealistic type of composition is a way to question because if someone looks at this juxtaposition of a shell, a beetle, what the heck is that hat? Some sort of molecular thing. and. Uh, Pipe is just sort of a way of going, huh? Which means you're questioning and you're questioning your own notions or your own perhaps prejudices about uh, gender. The next slide is called The Silent Women, Woman, excuse me, which is also from my Gender Renaissance series. And um, they are more gender non-binary or gender non-conforming. This is um, a bit of a narrative uh, type of um, narrative and symbolic and surrealistic. I kind of like all of those influences uh, to just sort of um, ask questions and to, to present with dignity and again in the past saying that this is nothing new. Silent Woman is actually a title from a play from the time of Shakespeare. So um, and this one is called Forbidden Fruit which is very gothic. I like the whole gothic thing. <laughs> and it's alluding to um, well, the Garden of Eden and, you know, man and woman and just going going all the way back to questioning gender. Um, I kind of wanted to make this one feel a bit very, um, well, um, 
gothic yet a bit futuristic at the same time with this orb that's green and reflecting on her face. Um, the next slide, we're getting into uh, the other series, which is a conjuring of conjurers. And I guess I'll speak briefly about my style of painting, which I call um, colonial, which is maybe perhaps in the Philippines or Mexico, where you have this mixture of influence, which is European and traditional master whatever painting with indigenous painting. And it sort of turns out like this. <laughs> it's ended up being my style of painting, which I guess um, feels natural being of mixed heritage. My mother being African-American and my father being white. I am between the two cultures. Um, so I feel that this style of painting is authentic to who I am. This painting is called Isant, and it's based on a character from a book by um, uh, Joris Karl Usman, which was called Against Nature. And he was the key character, key character, Des Isant. And this is where I got the idea for my show, A Conjuring of Conjurers. The book is all about this guy who retires from society and he more or less uh, builds his own dream of the census fortress, you know, where he's um, just made this amazing place where he's ex explored all aspects of everything, art, culture, mm, taste, smells, uh, plants, everything. And um, so I was thinking after I read this book, oh, this is a great idea. I want to do something with it. And essentially, what is it about? It's about conjuring your own reality. So I, I'm, I did this show called A Conjuring of Conjurers. In the next slide, you'll see um, more examples of how I brought this idea to fruition. I've got a large banner in, in the middle, and then these two totems are rather large. They're like eight feet tall that are conjurers. So it's like these conjurers have done the conjuring of the artwork and created this environment and I wanted to kind of have them set up like their scenes from a tableau or a play and um, they each have their own names each of per each figure that I've done or painting is a conjurer you have Pione on the left Septim in the middle and Fern Nest and just to give you an idea they all have their own stories the banner the the woman in the middle is Septim a collector of breezes hoarder of voices and gatherer of olfactory ephemera. She once changed her lover into a lake to protect him. The next slide is the one that the Crocker uh, bought, which is wonderful. And this is a banner painting as well. And this is Zer Zerpanta, born under the shade of a black willow tree in New Orleans in 1826, sits on a rock turning rain into tobacco smoke. And, um, yeah, so it's just this idea of each of these conjurers have their own interesting powers or way of manifesting and creating a different reality. This is the collage that was already spoken about. I turned my back on the ocean, be facing the ocean. And just the collages were very fun to do, very free, very sort of stream of consciousness and just kind of exploring this idea of otherworldliness and and conjuring different realities and, and kind of really trying to get in touch with a very melancholic kind of mood, which this one is kind of, that's us for me at least. <laughs> this is Yasa and Yasa is a trickster. He lives in every corner of the forest. Sometimes she appears as a goat with a woman's head, passing in and out of the visible world, partaking in ridiculous orgies. So similar to my gender renaissance series, I just sort of jumbled different um, objects to sort of create this whole narrative or story about this person's experience and their magical or mystical powers and juxtaposing uh, items with animals and plants and coral and and what have you just to sort of get at uh, a portrait is the objects are extensions of their minds their dreams or being an extension of their selves. The next slide is Nasida, another banner painting. And um, being a mixed race, I often explore the notion of race in different ways. And in this portrait, I wanted to do negative, like a painting of a negative to see if I could do that. Um, 
Nasita is a hit or miss mind reader. Sometimes tears trickle from her ears when she is overwhelmed by the inner feelings of others. This series was done in 2019 at my gallery in Los Angeles at Walter Maciel Gallery. This is another one of the uh, large totem figures and this is Ophida. The abandoned bride finds books and broken branches, sermons and stones, rituals and roots and sagas and silences. So this was really fun to do. I'll often just sort of take a mono, you know, a color, monochromatic. And I had this wild fiber fill coming out of the necks of these, of these totems. And these kind of represent smoke, a combination of smoke and hair and different um, items uh, strewn about her, around her, beneath her. I even had like a bulb that was from like a tulip or something. And throughout this show, it started like actually sprouting with no water or soil or anything. So that was sort of interesting to have this living um, sculpture. <laughs> In the next slide, this is the series that I'm working on now, which is called Black Garden. And the um, show is based on a poem by Antonin Artaud. The poem is called Black Garden. And each of the titles is a stanza or a line or two from the poem. And so this one is of a bed of night iris shedding petals one by one like the hours of darkness. And so once again, they're, they may look like headdresses, but they're actually extensions of the being of the people. And I like inserting um, something that looks like it's a photograph, but it's, I painted it, but it's in black and white to kind of jolt you a bit. Um, I have initial joltings of like whatever I'm painting on, be it fabric or other found objects. I put things in these found kitsch frames. This is a Sirocco like Italian frame. They made them in the 60s they are actually plastic, but they're meant to look like these over the top Rococo frames. Um, so I like to juxtapose all these things just to sort of stir things up to get one thinking. And inside of all of these images of mm, like creatures from the sea and design and bones and and her visage, her face, is a solitary tree with a house kind of in, in fog in the countryside, just to kind of, this contrast between the brightly colored uh, reality and then the reality of her dreams, of her memories, of her being. And in the very last slide, which is also from my Black Garden series, it's titled, Of the Luminous Hour Glittered Strange. And again, I've um, juxtaposed images of uh, nature. This is a chameleon with a twig and some sort of pod and swords. And, you know, I just sort of like to do it sort of freestyle, kind of like um, working on it over a long time to make sure that all of these images form some sort of meaning for me that, um, you know, maybe isn't like literally a translation of the poem but somehow fits the mood of the poem. And this, this show is different from the previous two where I really just wanted to go within, not have it be about socialist issues such as race or gender or um, things that are going on currently, but just kind of going in within, going into my, my inner self, my feelings. As everybody's been uh, dealing with the pandemic and staying at home, I thought it was just something that felt quite natural to do. And as the hour of glass indicates, time is running out. I'm now finished with my slide presentation. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for being here and for the really enlightening presentation. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot myself. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. um, so I thought we could just chat for a few minutes. I, of course, have a million questions to ask, but we'll promise to only just ask a few. And I do encourage anyone in the audience to type in your questions for Leslie. After Leslie and I chat for a few minutes, we're going to open it up for attendee questions. So just a plug to get your questions in here whenever you, whenever the, the sort of inspiration hits, I should say. So Leslie, my first question is about Los Angeles as a place and how has Los Angeles factored into your art making process or maybe it hasn't, I'm, I'm curious to know <laughs> about LA as a place. Right, well, that's an interesting question because I'm such a hermit, you know, <laughs> even before the pandemic, I like staying at home and as my conjuring of conjurers sort of have, have 
even, you know, created my reality at home and enjoying that. But um, yeah, the great thing for me about Los Angeles and growing up in LA and uh, I mean, I briefly lived in San Francisco and New York and France for a minute, but um, it's just the diversity, you know, I'm mixed, I'm African American and white and I, I just appreciate the fact that there's such diversity and there are many cities who have diversity, but the areas are quite segregated. And I feel like Los Angeles is not as much like that as other cities are. Uh, so that's just great. It's kind of a mess. It's not beautiful architecturally, even though I love beautiful architecture in cities. I just sort of like that it's laid back and it's kind of like nobody brags about, oh, you're coming to LA. I've got to show you this and this and this. It's just sort of like, we don't do that, which I kind of appreciate. <laughs> what are you going to say? Um, you know, I kind of like that. It's sort of opposite of city pride, the fact that people aren't super proud about that. I, I appreciate that, you know. I do actually now live a bit outside of L.A. I live near the ocean. I love being near the ocean. Um, having always ha had it there, you know, not being in the, in the Midwest or anything like that. That's a big influence. And um yeah, the art scene, I really like too. Um, it's changing now, but it's always felt kind of funkier than the New York art scene, a bit more laid back and fun kind of, you know, um, not quite as corporate, although I imagine everything like that is changing all over the place. Uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, in so many interviews and writings about your family, it talks a lot about the Watts Towers. Do you remember going to the Watts Towers with your mom, Betty Sarr, oh, yes. or your uh -huh. dad? Yeah, where I was born was actually in a house not too far from there. And then later we moved to Hermosa Beach and then in Laurel Canyon, where my mom still lives, you know. And um, yeah, there's a great photo of us with my mom and Allison and I, I don't think my youngest sister, Tracy, was born yet. We're both like in shorts with no shirt on. So it must have been really hot. <laughs> and I have maybe like five or six and Allison's three or four. Um, so it's kind of this uh, photograph to document the fact that, yes, indeed, we did go there. <laughs> She's holding each of her hands and we're just sort of half naked in this photo. Um, this is a great family memory, it seems like. <laughs> And so much of your work, I think, kind of stems from a sense of memory as well, which is really interesting. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about who or what are your biggest influences? Yeah, well, you know, it's so funny. When I really think about that, like when I was young and what might have sort of formed me and what have you, it's actually more in the form of, of music. I, um, As you mentioned, I worked at a radio station and I was sort of dealing more with the music aspects within this collective. And um, it was just like such an amazing period of time, the early 70s in Berkeley, you had Black Panthers and SLA and just so much that was going on politically and then also musically, really avant-garde or new music as they called it. And I was friends with a lot of these musicians and I would always, since I had a press card, I could go hear them. <laughs> Even though I wasn't 21 yet, I could go into them like the Keystone in San Francisco and see all these musicians like Miles Davis or the Art Ensemble of Chicago. And just the spontaneity, the active improvisation, um, it's sort of um, equated with my artistic influence, which of course is my mother with the found objects and that sort of thing, but also surrealistic artists such as Leonora Carrington or Emilio Svaros or Frida Kahlo. Um, uh, and I just always liked surrealism from an early age, like you know, photography as well as uh, as painting. But um, my, like, I really kind of feel like literature and music, especially literature, often will influence when I get an idea for a show, such as Mad Woman in the Attic that I do with the female uh, insane heroines from 19th century literature or Conjuring of Conjurers from that Usman novel, that 18th century novel. That's great. Um, I share that love of the 19th century and you probably heard that in, mm -hmm. you know, in the exhibition itself with the hysteria and the madness and those exactly. sorts of things. Yeah, that's that whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that you kind of started your career um, altering books, which is really interesting. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that came about? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, when I was uh, up in the Bay Area, I was like going to school um, and I met a lot of writers from working at the radio station. 
Um, and I would do illustrations for them, such as Ishmael Reed or Jessica Hagedorn or David Henderson, the poet who lives in New York now. But there are incredible writers at the time, such as Ntozeka Saki Shange lived up there. She was roommates with my boyfriend at the time. And so that's how I started was doing illustrations for my writer friends. Growing up, I was always more inclined to drawing than painting. So I think my paintings actually come, come from a drawing um, kind of approach or collage. And then from that, I said, well, let me make my own little books and stories. I'm not a writer, you know, and then I kind of got rid of the writing part of it and just would take these books, carve them out, put a painting that I had done inside of them and encase them in glass. So that this notion of a book, which I just love reading so much, right away that gimmick or what have you is going to suggest you're going to be transported, you're going to be taken on some sort of journey or read some sort of tale. And those works that are inside of the books are rather narrative. And that's sort of, I think, just sort of naturally how that idea came about. That's great. And I love so much that your many of your works um, come with their own narrative. The title is so much its own story. Oh, um, does, does that come from your work with books or how did that come about with the, the longer narrative titles? Yeah, I think so. Well, I did write all of the things for The Conjurers. I just sort of had to think about these stories and kind of come up with different logic for them and just really sort of have fun with that. And I did a lot of research about hoodoo and voodoo in New Orleans. Um, I guess I'd forgotten to mention my grandfather. My mother's mom is from uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So that really feels like home when I go to Louisiana and um, Brazil and Africa and even, you know, like Russian folklore and that kind of thing with magic, mm -hmm. doing a lot, a lot of research and then kind of writing these stories. Oh, it took months, you know, just really got, and since I made them goofy, it's like they didn't have to be particularly good writing. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it stems from that, you know, my interest well, in reading. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, let's see, I have one more question for you before we turn it over to the questions from the crowd. But I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on what you hope visitors take away from the show at the Crocker. Do you have any key themes or key thoughts or things that you hope visitors will think about as they walk through the space? Um, you know, first and foremost, it's just sort of to talk about family. I mean, I just love my family and we're just so close. And often people will think, oh, well, there must be jealousy or conflict or what have you, because we all ended up being in the arts. And, um, you know, we, we do each do something rather different, although in this exhibition there isn't a lot of um allison sculpture but that's primarily what she does and my mother does assemblage and collage and installation and i focused on painting so even though we're crossing mediums i think people can see how um how a family can create art and how you can see the similarities and yet the differences and just sort of come away with that harmony and then maybe sort of look at maybe what some of the common themes are which are history alice and my mother and i were interested in history and it's wonderful to be in a museum like the crocker which has such a historic um you know background and and everything and um maybe see how we use the notion of history to address contemporary issues and um I don't know, just to sort of relax and, and enjoy it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it gives us so much to think about from race and racism and identity, but through exactly. memory and family, and then also just thinking about process and art making and techniques. And I think what's so fantastic is that there's really something for everyone. And I think the more you look, the more you see when, mm -hmm. um, when looking at your work and the work of Allison and Betty, your mother and sister. Mm -hmm. um, I know, Leslie, we've got a whole bunch of questions coming in from the okay. audience. So <laughs> I'm going to ask Amalia Griego, our development officer, to rejoin us. And Amalia will be posing the questions. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll stay on here just in case there's anything Crocker related that comes up. But um, Leslie, we're most interested to hear um, more about your art making process. So with that, Amalia, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jamie. Yes, we've got some great questions coming in. And you were talking about your family, Leslie. And our first question from Elizabeth is, 
have you and your mom and your sister created a piece together? Uh, yes, we had a, a show that was traveling around together that started at the, um, uh, I believe it was the Katona Museum in, in uh, North Carolina, the, the University of North Carolina. And we did, I'm trying to remember what the name of it was, but we together did an installation that honored my father because he had passed away perhaps a year before the uh, piece opened. And my mother did something with, um, it was sort of about time. I had done like a large drawing and my mother had done a piece with, um, with cloths and Allison had incorporated her sculpture. So that's the one time that we actually made one piece together. And then that show traveled around a bit too. So. Okay, great. Um, you also spoke about your time working at a radio station. Uh -huh. And Melissa is wondering if there are any music or sounds that are currently influencing your creative process. Oh, yeah. Well, today, um, not that I was exactly nervous about this, but <laughs> I have like a, um, a playlist of rain sound. <laughs> Something in Southern California, it never rains. And I just sort of was listening to that for like, 15 minutes, um, <laughs> but I love r and I like going to r and clubs. I listen to a lot of classic r and like Luther Vandross, Teddy Pendergrass, all those guys and, and contemporary r and I like um, jazz that I've mentioned before, like avant-garde jazz, I listen to Sun Rob. I just want to get out like through a portal. I'll listen to Alice Coltrane or John Coltrane or um, different playlists that kind of have uh, futuristic sounding jazz and I'm a very eclectic reggae oh everything <laughs> sounds like a good playlist <laughs> uh and we have kelsey wondering how has your artistic style changed over time and is your work or style influenced by the work of any other artist um well i imagine everybody wants to say that um, their style hasn't changed, but I have made, I made a concerted effort to improve my technique, and uh, I do think I'm a better painter. I did not go into art school. I majored in radio, TV, film, um, first at Laney, then at San Francisco State, and then finished up at Cal State Northridge. Um, so I'm not trained, even though both my parents were artists, you know, I'm not classically trained, and so I, I think... Mm, I think it's improved. As far as me having a vision and being able to get it the way I want to look, that's going a lot faster. So that has changed. But you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and I look at some of those old books and um, I was putting people in Victorian outfits back then and they were surreal back then. And um, the themes, there's always been the backdrop of, of race and questioning um, being biracial, but for all intents and purposes, appearing white. The question of, um, is race how you are perceived by others or is it who you are inside, your DNA, your family, your experiences, who you know you are? And it's a combination of both, you know? I mean, especially now, it's of course, I'm not experiencing as a light skin or white passing the oppression and, and racism that someone who is ostensibly black is. But so that's something I'm always addressing in my work, questioning this notion of race. And that has not changed much. I'll do people who are um, albino. I meant to mention that in the, that banner of Miss um, Purley, the, um, the transcontinental mind reader. I'll often do portraits of a person with albinism to kind of serve as a metaphor for myself. A uh, black person with albinism is like me. I'm black, but I look white. So I have done portraits of people with albinism since the 1990s. So the themes are, are continuing. Um, I'll do someone very dark skin with blue eyes, just sort of to mix up this notion of race and what um, is considered uh, normal within race. I question notions of normalcy with regard to race and gender and sanity and beauty and all of those things. I think that's been a constant. Good. Um, and this might be a question for both Jamie and Leslie. Andrea is wondering how the Crocker became involved with the Saar family. Yeah, well, I can I can talk a little bit about the first work that came into the collection was actually Betty Saar's Remember Friendship, which you saw in the video um, earlier on in the event. 
And that was actually donated to the museum by the Sacramento chapter of Lynx in 1975. Mm -hmm. So the Crocker has owned a work by Betty Saar since then, and then has added to the collection um, kind of continuously from there, uh, especially in the last couple of years um, when we did have the donations of Allison's copacetic portfolio, as well as Betty Saar's uh, Bookmarks in the Pages of Life, which is a series based upon the writings of Zora Neale Hurston, the Harlem Renaissance writer and anthropologist. And you also saw Alison Sars DWP2 in the video. So those were those were some of the um, works that came into the collection roughly within the last seven years, seven to eight years or so. But it really started back in 1975. Um, and Leslie, your works have come into the collection a little bit more recently and really thrilled to have one of your larger scale banners, the Zerpenta banner, and then the smaller photograph collage piece. Um, maybe Leslie, do you mind telling us again which two series those works come from? Uh, yes, well, both of those are from A Conjuring of Conjurers. It was a, lar it was a large gallery, Walter Maciel's gallery. And in the, the first room, a small room, had that Ophita uh, totem, the one all in kind of an mm -hmm. ivory, and then the collages that sort of formed the strange cross, and down the middle were uh, that collage, uh, I turned my back on the ocean. Um, so that room had collages, and then the other room had the oval paintings and large banners and, and the totem sculpture. So that was from, a both of those were from a conjuring of conjuring, mm -hmm. which was a 20, Gosh, 2020 it doesn't seem like it. Yeah, <laughs> recent. I know the last year. I know there was a question earlier in the um, in the comments, Amalia, about conjurers. And uh, Leslie, if you could tell us in your definition what you think a conjurer is, or how you think of a conjurer. Okay, a conjurer actually can have different connotations. Like a conjurer can be like a magician. I guess I guess it's kind of um, similar to. Uh, or a conjurer who does voodoo or hoodoo or witchcraft, a person who can cast spells or hexes on someone or make a reality happen um, by using different um, elements such as graveyard dirt or chicken bones or that kind of thing. And um, so my research entailed like looking at countries such as Brazil or, um, uh, Haiti, you know, or you have voodoo and hoodoo and um, the different uh, religions and, and sorts, sorts of uh, folklore and history within that. So it, it's kind of um, an expansive definition <laughs> as far as how I incorporated it. Well, speaking, you mentioned voodoo in your answer, and uh, Kelly is asking, in your studies of voodoo and earlier literary studies, would you say that your work were inspired by magical realism as well? Oh, sure. I've read a lot of that. Uh huh. You know, um, I like books that are uh, that are quite creative in that way. Um, you know, I'm not like a scholar on voodoo or anything like that, but it's a, it's been an interest of mine for oh yeah. 40, you know, the very, for several decades. And um, so often when I'll get an idea like this, like I said, this idea came from a totally different, nothing to do with voodoo, this book against nature. And then you sort of have to think in your mind, well, how am I going to, to present this? Like this idea of monad, how is that actually going to look? Or I've got a transgender son and I want to do an art show about that. How is that physically going to look? What's going the scale going to be? And um, so it's not so much about um, literally studying so much these, I'll get the idea from something happening in my life or something I've read. The gender renaissance is more something that was really happening a lot in my life. All right, I also did a show called Autist Fables that dealt with having a child with autism. So then it's sort of like, well, how do you get this across? And for the monad, I wanted the works to be quite small. They're all like under 30 inches because I wanted them to be quite detailed, like to depict these tiny cells, like really, really detailed with tiny, tiny brushes, like 20 over zero. You know, so that will uh, inform the, the scale and the approach, the medium of, of what the, the show is. Great. 
Um, another question we've had a couple of times now, did you ever feel pressure to create growing up in a family of artists? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, not so much pressure. We, um, you know, we're always encouraged to be creative. And so my mom was always giving us projects to do like, oh, let's make a mosaic table. But we took dance and music lessons and acting classes and you know a lot of fun stuff so it didn't feel like we were being trained to be artists and um i think it was a bit of a pressure because my mother became rather well known in the 1970s and so when i went to college it was like well it would just show a complete lack of imagination to major in the field that both my mother and father did <laughs> i.e art so, um, and I was working at the radio station at the time. So I just made that my major. I just really love music and interviewing people and that kind of thing. So it wasn't until I was pregnant with my first child, Sola, that I thought, well, I'm pregnant, I'm at home. I'll do this art. There's like no pressure because I'm just doing it because I'm home. I kind of gave myself an out. <laughs> and um, and then I found like, well, you know, I'm really enjoying this. And, it's just like any other family. If your father's a, a doctor, you might be a good doctor. It just might be possibly in your DNA, you know, like kind of why, why fight it? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you decided to be an artist. Um, we do have time for one more question. Uh, do you have some artist whose work resonates with you or that you are inexplicably drawn to? Uh, well, yes, I have. I do have someone I could recommend. His name is Umar Rashid, and he also goes by Frohawk Two Feathers. And he's a friend. He's a black artist who lives also here in L.A. And um, he does these amazing, intricate paintings and drawings that involve um, conflicts. And he also deals with history. So we both sort of like each other's work for that reason. And he addresses colonialism and he sort of alters history. They're really imaginative and very different. Everybody's work looks like this. So Umar Rashi, I recommend him. <laughs> well, before we close out, Jamie or Leslie, are there any comments you'd like to make? Anything you'd like to say about the exhibition before we finish up today? Leslie, did you want to go ahead? Um, well, no, I'm just, I just want to say thank you. Um, Thank you for having this show. It's it's really lovely, and I hope I get a chance to come up and see it. And um, I, uh, you know, I'm just really honored to to be included in the show and to have done this talk with you all. So thanks. Oh, thanks. It's been I mean, it's been fantastic, Leslie. Thanks so much for joining us and for having your work in the show and just creating what you create. Um, I will say, just in terms of the show itself, what I'm thrilled about is that the Crocker will be reopening in the next few weeks. So there's going to be a chance to see this one in person. It's up all the way in through mid August. So there's lots of time to come in person and see the show. And all 23 works are in the Crocker's permanent collection. So these are all works that the Crocker owns. Some of them you've seen before in other shows or maybe the permanent collections galleries. Some of the works, this is the very first time that they've ever been on view at the Crocker. So this is really exciting and, and quite a thrill for us. Um, there are 11 works uh, by Betty, 10 by Allison, and two by Leslie. So we have a nice array also of prints, of painting, sculpture, um, installation pieces, assemblage pieces. So there's a lot, a lot to see, a lot to look at. And as Leslie and I have chatted over the last um, hour here, you can really dive deep. Um, the more you look, I think the more you see with all of the works in the show. Definitely. Well, thank you again, both of you, Leslie and Jamie, your time for your time today, your insight and knowledge. It's been wonderful. Thank you thank very you. much. And I wanna say thank you to our members. Without you, programs like this could not be possible. And your support allows us to connect people to art, ideas, each other, and the world around them. So thank you. And lastly, as I think you know, Sacramento County has been moved to the red tier, which means the museum will be reopening soon. So please stay tuned to your emails for reopening announcements. Thank you again. Have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.